Okay, I want to welcome everyone to this Workers' World Party public forum. Um, the main report is going to be on Follow the Money, what's behind the Hong Kong protest. Um, before we get into our program, I want to make a few announcements. First of all, I want to thank the cooks for this wonderful dinner tonight. Comrades Sherry and Mary. Thank you so much. It's wonderful. Very delicious. And also, I want to bring everybody's attention to the new copy of the Workers' World newspaper with the front page headline, Tell Greyhound Ice Off Our Buses. This is a very important demonstration that FIRE is organizing tomorrow, and we'll hear a report from Nate about this. But we have the fire statement on the front page. Um, <clears throat> other articles include um, the struggle over cashmere, uh, the fact that the races were forced to cancel in Portland, Oregon, the police war on Philadelphia, athletes and social justice, and we have two wonderful editorials. Trans Rights Now and the Squad in, in Defense of Palestine. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we really want to urge everyone to take uh, not, not just one copy, but take, a, take several copies with you. We're going to be getting this out tomorrow uh, at the Port Authority demonstration, but take some with you. You can take a stack of papers with you to get them you know, to your job or your school or laundromats, etc. We really want to get the paper out as far and wide as possible. Okay. So the agenda tonight will be uh, Sarah Flounders, a writer for Workers' World uh, newspaper, uh, who's going to be giving the report on Hong Kong, including um, a PowerPoint presentation. But before we hear from Sarah, we're going, oh, um, first of all, I want to um, welcome some, some guests you know, to our meeting. You'll see all these cameras up here. I just want to let you know who's here. Uh, we have Fred Wind. Fred Wind is videoing for a New Jersey Cable Public Access. We have Will Griffin from Philadelphia, who's the founder of the Peace Report which is in the slogan that on his card is support independent media, which we all do. So welcome, Will. Uh, of Sue from People's Video Network, who films our meetings every week. Sophia is live streaming uh, for the Workers' World Party Facebook page. And even though he doesn't have his camera tonight, I want to introduce Joe Friendly, <laughs> who is well-known <laughs> videographer for many decades. So anyway, and other friends and, of course, our members, welcome. So, um, I want to introduce Nate Chase, who will be giving a report about tomorrow's anti-ice demonstration. Good evening, friends and comrades. I um, just wanted to give a brief report about tomorrow's um, action. Uh, we had a, another comrade prepared to give a longer political uh, talk, but they uh, weren't available due to a, some emergency situation. So, I just wanted to talk a little bit about tomorrow's demonstration and the context for it. Um, the banner slogan for the demonstration is um, ICE off our buses and Greyhound collaboration with ICE. Um, ICE and the Border Patrol, Department of Homeland Security, regularly search Greyhound buses um, in an attempt to detain undocumented migrants and deport them. Um, this is a not only obviously a disgusting crime against humanity um, and an attack on our class, it's also something um, that uh, even within the minimal constitutional rights that one might say one has in this country, particularly if one is a migrant or oppressed person, um, something that ICE is actually not allowed to do. Um, and there's currently an ACL lawsuit against ICE, against Greyhound, saying that Greyhound does not have to and should not collaborate with these searches. Greyhound claims that they are obligated to, to, um, to collaborate with ICE as, um, and, and use that to sort of wash their hands 
of this crime that goes on on their watch. Um, the bus drivers union, the Greyhound bus drivers union, has spoken out very publicly against these searches um, and has demanded they be stopped. And again, the, the Greyhound, which has the power and legal authority to refuse these searches, uh, refuses to do so. So there's a lawsuit, but of course a lawsuit isn't, isn't anything by itself. It needs to struggle in the streets to raise people's consciousness and put pressure on Greyhound to refuse to allow these searches. But of course, we know we can't rely on the ruling class to fight ICE. We can't rely on the ruling class um, to, to fight the, for migrants. Um, that takes people's power, power of the working and the oppressed to fight back. And so that's why a very important part of the demonstration and all the literature we've been giving out to publicize it is raising consciousness of people's rights about what you can do if you see this happen. ICE does not have the legal authority to search a Greyhound bus, or any bus. And so if you are on a bus or vehicle of public transit, and you see ICE get on, or Department of Homeland Security, or Border Patrol, or whatever fascist acronym they have these days, you have the right to tell everyone on the bus, you have the right to say, we don't have to show IDs. And you have the right to refuse to show IDs, you have the right to record them, and you have the right to tell everyone else on that bus that they don't have to show IDs. And if you're not a migrant, this is a really important opportunity for solidarity right. to stand up with those who are not going to feel comfortable, who may not feel comfortable saying, I don't want to show ID. But if everyone on the bus says, no, we're not doing it, where's your warrant, you don't have a warrant, get off this bus, and this has been proven to work, it's been proven in, in video recorded incidents that the, the united power of the working and oppressed will push ICE back. And so that's, that's what we need, that's what we need to raise consciousness of, is if all of us together can fight back against this racist deportation machine. So that's why tomorrow at 6 p.m. at Port Authority, 42nd and 8th, we're going to be out there on the streets, a great program, a picket, giving out information saying, ICE off our buses and Greyhound collaboration with ICE. Um, so I hope to see everyone there tomorrow at 6 p.m. Um, if you'd like to help with the demonstration in terms of any particular tasks or roles, please see me after the meeting and we can, um, and we can discuss that. And uh, we've had a lot of really exciting, packed organizing meetings here the past month. Big crowds, lots of experienced activists, also really exciting, a lot of new people. People who are just coming into the struggle, people who are migrants, people who aren't migrants, people who are understanding it's the unity of our class that's going to fight back and destroy this racist deportation machine. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Nate. Okay, and now we'll hear from Sarah. We're going to start with a little video. Yeah, first. Turn down one line. Television station and a Chinese uh, 
rap group, uh, because uh, that's going to be barred. It's been barred by Facebook and by Twitter. It's one of 900 accounts that are believed established by the Chinese government to deliberately sow discord by undermining the legitimacy of the political protest movement in China. That, that's a direct quote. And along with that, they're going to shut down accounts for a larger network of about 200,000 Twitter accounts uh, before they even become active. Facebook's head of cybersecurity said that the, they had also removed Facebook accounts for 15,000 people and another uh, 2,200 members who are under investigation as having dangerous connections to China. And the new uh, controls, however, they went out of their way to say, don't apply to taxpayer-funded entities in the U.S. Now, that means groups like the National Endowment for Democracy, in case you're wondering what, what uh, tax-funded entities are talking about. So any of their sites aren't under attack. They also said it wouldn't apply to the Voice of America and other U.S.-owned or UK owned, like the BBC, social media platforms. So the only ones who apparently are spreading any disinformation on the protests uh, is anyone who's supportive of China. And, and they are going to remove their sites. Uh, seems two-faced, it seems contradictory. Any position that undermines the legitimacy of the political positions of the Hong Kong protest movement isn't going to be allowed to stay up. So tonight's an experiment. We'll see how long even this live stream stays up, right? Uh, but it's important to know what they're trying to do. They want to project one message, and they want to demand that the people of the whole world only get that message. Now, what are the demonstrations in Hong Kong? What are the issues? We're told again and again and again that these demonstrators are simply pro-democracy. And that's why the U.S. government is so overwhelmingly supportive. Why are the protesters regularly flying U.S. and British and Hong Kong colonial flag, the old colonial flag, in their demonstrations? both in the mass demonstrations and even in the, in the street confrontations as they break into things, as they're flowing, uh, throwing uh, Molotov cocktails and flaming bricks and bars and so on. And, and how did a movement in China, because this is part of China, come to identify so strongly with the U.S. and with Britain? Now, this is a question, because there are a lot of people in the streets, and we don't want to deny that, but we want to understand how this came about. The corporate media has given more coverage than it's ever given to any protest, and every major Democratic or Republican politician has praised these pro-democracy demonstrations. Now, for everyone here tonight, it's against capitalism, the theft of our labor, the impoverishment of the vast majority for the benefit of the super rich. And we're also against killer cops and racist courts, mass incarceration, the raids and roundups of ICE. We oppose more than 800 U.S. bases around the world, U.S. coups, U.S. wars, U.S. invasions, sanctions. We fight for health care, for housing. And always we oppose the ruling class right here. That's a fundamental question. So we take sides in the class struggle. We're not neutral. So what's our view? When people are in the streets, do we just automatically support them? It can be easy on, a, on Gaza, on Haiti, on the yellow vests in France, on the Philippines, on the Black Lives Matter movement on all the demonstrations in solidarity with migrants, against the caging of children, the LGBTQ struggle. And in all of this, we know the importance of symbols. 
We know what it means if a demonstration, like in Charlottesville, uses a Confederate flag or swastikas. We, we know what that means. Or they're wearing a Make America Great red Trump hats. Or militia outfits. We know that we're on the opposite side and that these movements are a deadly threat to poor and working people and to all people of color, to the LGBTQ people, and especially to migrants. Now, in another culture, it can be harder to see if, what's it mean if you're carrying a British flag, if you're carrying a Hong Kong colonial flag, what's that mean? So it's not going to make sense unless we look at it in the context of China's history and long liberation struggle. Unless you see it that way, it doesn't make a lot of sense. What does it mean if you tear down the symbol of the People's Republic of China and put up the British flag? It's clear you're on the other side, and that's a side of racism and war and colonialism. Now, if you praise the way things were in the past, I think here in the U.S. we all get it. If you cry out for the lost cause of the Old South, wasn't it grand? If you want to build statues that memorialize fallen soldiers, we know that means war and racism and reaction of the most vicious sort. There is a reactionary mass movement in Hong Kong that's based on building entitlement, arrogance, maintaining a demand of special status, and it is rooted in Hong Kong's colonial past. And that's exactly what the movement in Hong Kong is saying. Hong Kong should have, maintain its special status, its special administrative zone. We don't want to be part of China. So let's ask, how did Hong Kong's special status come about? Hong Kong has actually had special status for 200 years. It was the most spectacular deep water port on the South China Sea at the mouth of the Pearl River, the largest trade river. And it was stolen from China in a war that set the whole cities in flames. I want to talk about that just a little bit. When the British and the French and the Spanish and the Portuguese and the U.S merchants were setting up colonies and trading stations and also forcing peoples throughout Africa, throughout the Americas, throughout Asia to sign completely unequal treaties when there was any treaty at all, it was an era of aggressive slave trade, the genocide of the indigenous peoples. And during this time toward China, the British and the U.S. and the French and the Dutch and the Spanish and the Portuguese were all anxious to trade with China. They wanted the porcelain, the silk, the tea. But capitalism by its very nature is an aggressive expansionist system that's never satisfied. It's insatiable. It drives for more. So what these merchants wanted was free access to China's market, no restrictions. And China didn't want to give access. They wanted trade with payment in silver and just in special trading areas. It was a feudal social structure, very highly developed. Now, Britain set up a whole industry in India to grow and cure and refine, concentrate opium. They produced tons of it, boatloads of it. It was a huge industry. This is a warehouse, top to bottom. British merchants began the sale of opium from India to China. And US merchants, they had similar warehouses and were involved in the trade of opium from Turkey. The Chinese government felt this was a very dangerous drug and they tried to prohibit it as millions and millions of people became addicted. And they first outlawed it, and then when that had no impact on the merchants, 
they seized and burned two and a half million pounds of opium, just what was in the warehouses at that time. There were two wars fought and lost by China to try to restrict the opium trade, but they didn't have the military technology of the West. There was a, a British invasion of China with gunboats more powerful than any weapons that the Chinese Empire had. And the British, in a, in a block with the other imperialist powers, set up a blockade of the Pearl River. They sent a full-scale military expedition, naval expedition, with 44 armed steamships, heavy cannon, rockets, infantry, long-range fire. And the antiquated uh, Chinese warships were absolutely destroyed. And then the British ships sailed not only up the Pearl River, up the Zhujiang River, the Yangtze River. They occupied Shanghai, seized the tax collection barges, did, it literally looted entire cities. China was defeated and was forced to sign a completely unequal treaty, a whole series of unequal treaties. The U.S. also had a whole series of completely unequal treaties that gave these merchants access to all the major port cities in China. And in fact, these treaties were really terms of surrender. China was actually forced to pay reparations for the burned opium. And these fleets of ships, U.S. Navy, British Navy, they had riverboats that sailed a thousand miles inland, dominated also all the coastal waters. This map is very interesting if you can make it out, but it's, it shows this network going into all the rivers of China for the opium trade. A lot of other trade, if, if you didn't like the terms a merchant gave, you simply blasted the gunboats and destroyed the warehouse. That settled it, and this was well understood. The, there was foreign military stationed in China to back up. It was not only the warships. There were U.S. Marines on the armored warships all along the China's coast, and there were special fleets of river gunboats, the U.S. Navy. So this is something we don't study in history. U.S. Marines patrolled China's rivers a thousand miles inland, and they were there to enforce trade interests, and suppress uprisings. And there were many uprisings, many. There were U.S. Marines stationed, garrisoned in Beijing, in Guangzhou, then called Canton, in Shanghai, from 1818 to 1949. That is 130 years of occupation, and you won't find it in a U.S. history book. They trained and educated a whole army of collaborators and administrators. There were Christian minister, minis missionaries who established churches. European law in all matters took precedence. This uh, pompous military officers of all the imperialist countries gathered together, it's like a group photo, shows they operated as one in this theft. Now, China called this a century of humiliation. Maybe I skipped a, a photo in here, so keep it on there for a bit. Um, Hong Kong, the Britain's deep water port, military and naval base, its warehouses, was a base of operations for this entire imperialist domination. Now, the Chinese Revolution, yeah, there we are, uh, was one of the biggest upheavals in history. The standing of the Chinese Communist Party is based in no small part on its ability over the past 70 years to break with the humiliations, chaos, and constant war, the famines caused by past gunboat diplomacy the decades of occupation by numerous foreign troops, the harsh and unequal treaties, the new communist government's intention was to ensure stable development, broad prosperity, while resisting foreign intervention. 
and this was a promise that Mao Zedong made in October 1949 while proclaiming the founding of the People's Republic of China. Go, go back one. Uh, Mao declared the Chinese people comprising a quarter of humanity have now stood up. In the same talk, he warned that every day and every minute the imperialists will try to stage a comeback. It's inevitable, it's beyond all doubt. But we will emerge in the world as a nation with an advanced culture, our national defense will be consolidated, and no imperialists will ever again be allowed to invade our land. So there was great determination, but China was also an impoverished country, war-torn, underdeveloped in every way, a peasant economy, almost no industry or infrastructure, mass illiteracy, no equal rights. Let's switch to the next. Enormous poverty, and that's what we want to address because this is a change today in China from massive poverty to incredible levels of development. China's growth has also been amazing and steady. There's never been a recession or a depression in 70 years. So it's a steady improvement in the standard of living. There have been many struggles over political line, over what path of economic development, many struggles internally. But the Chinese Communist Party has maintained control and steered through and kept the country unified and it's no small accomplishment. The UN figures it's the first country that actually succeeded in ending poverty and illiteracy. Those aren't just China's figures, those are UN missions. And during this time, both Hong Kong and Taiwan were the backdoor escape routes for the warlords and the feudal lords, and the Chinese and foreign capitalists escaping the Chinese Revolution. And that both the U.S. in Taiwan and Britain in Hong Kong provided a military and economic cover to pull these areas of China away from the revolution and use them as a, as a spear against the revolution. Now, in 1967, there was an uprising in Hong Kong. Let's go back to Hong Kong because really we could spend days, weeks, books, and have that's all been done, movies, on the Chinese Revolution. But let's see what was happening in Hong Kong. Uh, in 1967, there was an uprising in Hong Kong started by the lowest paid women workers who made plastic flowers. It grew into a general strike, and that strike and that uprising confirmed to the world that British colonialism's days were, even in Hong Kong, were numbered. As they were elsewhere at that time. You think of the 50s and the 60s in Africa, in Asia, in the Caribbean. A strike was organized by the Hong Kong Federation of Trade Unions. It was led by the Chinese Communist Party members in Hong Kong. And this union federation still has about over 400,000, 415,000 members in Hong Kong, and it remains to this day pro-China. This uprising was brutally suppressed. There were at least, this is by British admission, maybe more are claimed, but 51 people killed and many simply disappeared. Now, we should be clear whenever they talk about past democracy in Hong Kong that there were absolutely no rights on the books whatsoever under British colonialism. There was no right to free speech or freedom of assembly or freedom of unions. Democracy did not exist. And Britain was determined to make the same arrangements with Hong Kong that they had with their other former colonies who gained formal independence but were still economically chained to British imperialism. That's what the British Commonwealth is all about, isn't it? So let's get to 1997 
where there was a formal return of Hong Kong to China's sovereignty. It was under an agreement called One Country, Two Systems. Hong Kong as a center of finance capital would remain in place, and, but all foreign intervention and colonial claims on Hong Kong were supposed to end. Now, let's look at what capitalist relations in place have meant in Hong Kong. There's billions of dollars that have flowed through Hong Kong's banks from capitalist investment in the new factories that were set up in China. And that money has just poured in through the banks and back to the US and Britain and the whole imperialist system. It didn't go to the people of Hong Kong. It's today a city with the greatest inequality in the world. Most billionaires compared to the greatest poverty. Now, the Heritage Foundation lists Hong Kong as number one with the freest economy out of 180 countries in the world. Because it's free, because it has no restrictions on the banks, has low taxes, has no restraints. The rents are also the highest. Millions live in really terrible conditions in this modern city. It's hard to imagine that these wire dog kennels are considered housing. But there's more than 200,000 working people who pay rent to live in these terrible cages. The poverty rate in Hong Kong, it's one of the highest. It's about 20% of the population, one in five. And it's growing, it's growing. There's also millions of young people who can't afford their own apartments and they know in their lifetime they'll never have it. They're angered, alienated, frustrated. Almost all apartments are subdivided into tiny spaces, sublet to others, whole families live in one room except for the very rich. And then there's the homeless in Hong Kong. That means that even a cage is unaffor unaffordable. And their numbers have tripled in the last five years. Now, the US and British efforts to undercut Hong Kong's return began in advance of their signing in 1997. Shortly before the transfer of sovereignty, Britain hastily set up, after 150 years of appointed officials, a partially elected, but still mainly appointed government. And they established and funded political parties composed of their loyal collaborators. I want to talk a little bit about how this culture is maintained, because it didn't happen naturally. This is Alan Weinstein. He's a founder of the National Endowment for Democracy. He told the Washington Post, this is a rather stunning admission to do in an interview, to say so publicly. He said, a lot of what we do today was done covertly 25 years ago by the CIA. Damn right, it was. The NED, National Endowment for Democracy, funds, coordinates, and weaponizes non-governmental NGOs, organizations, and social organizations with the capacity to put tens of thousands of misdirected, idealistic, and alienated youth on the streets. Millions of dollars were openly and secretly funneled into a whole network of protected social service organizations, political parties, media, social media, student and youth organizations, labor unions, all with the idea of how to undercut support for China and the Communist Party of China. The NED bankrolls the Hong Kong Human Rights Movement, the Hong Kong Journalists Association, the Civic Party, the Labor Party, the Democratic Party, almost any organization that sort of sounds like something here or around the world, they'll have a name in Hong Kong, but it has a different role. They have a solidarity center, too. They fund the Human Rights Civil Rights Fund, 
Civil Human Rights Front that coordinates these demonstrations. They also set up something called the Hong Kong Confederation of Trade Unions. That's not the Hong Kong Federation. See how close the names are? And it receives National Endowment for Democracy funding, along with British support, and Rockefeller and Soros and a lot of others, to promote pro-democracy, independent unions throughout China. It was established in 1990 to counter and undercut the Hong Kong Federation of Trade Unions, which, as I said, has some 400,000 members. This funded organization does have, though, about 120,000 members, and it includes especially professional staff, social workers, uh, the airline pilots, when you think of the demonstrations at the airport and the crews, and so on. Now, the largest role of the NGOs and the church groups and the student federation and the union federations was to create a climate that glorifies past British and US role. And it looks to Western imperialism. British colonial past is deeply mythologized, and there's been 22 years since 1997. 22 years of constant nostalgia for this past, this supposedly glorious time. And that has a big influence on impoverished youth who've grown up with this, being the dominant culture in the youth and in church groups and in all kinds of organizations. There's 37,000 funded NGOs with staff in the tens of thousands. And they're able to put a small army of contra forces on the streets. That's absolutely true. He's both in mass confrontations with support and violent confrontations that there's training for. And that training is pretty open. You can find it on the internet in a hundred places. The U.S. State Department and U.S. politicians openly meet with the leadership of this movement. It is, as China says, this is an effort at a color revolution, such as happened in the Ukraine, such as happened in Syria, Serbia, Venezuela. Every effort to undermine and sabotage. Now, there's a larger effort to pull Hong Kong away from China as, as a way to really disrupt the socialist direction of China, which is becoming stronger and stronger, and, and imperialism is just beginning to realize that. So the goal is to promote a hostile, suspicious attitude toward China, toward communism, toward every form of socialism, and to foster a false concept of a past democratic Hong Kong with a distinct identity. Now, we could ask ourselves, is this just coincidence, or is this part of the arrest of the CEOs from China, the effort to block Huawei and 5G technology, the ban on software, the electronic components of Huawei technology? Is this part of the trade war? Is it connected to the military encirclement of China with missiles and 400 bases and aircraft carriers? Is it connected to the trade war or the effort to block China's companies from global markets? Is this a distinct development or is this part of a full court press against China to see if they can dislocate the leadership and the policies? Now, Xinhua News had an interesting editorial. They said, obviously, the US arrogant demands are beyond the scope of trade negotiations and touch on China's fundamental economic system. It shows that behind the US trade war against China, the US is trying to invade China's economic sovereignty and force China to damage its core interests. So that's, that's really even how China, they understand what this is. China today has a highly skilled and educated working class, many times larger than the US and the European Union and Japan all combined. It has advanced technology, internal cohesion, 
and many trading partners, and getting more and stronger trading partners. So it's in a strong position to resist U.S. demands. But that doesn't mean the demands aren't being made. There's lots of capitalists in China. We should admit that. It's a contradictory policy. We should admit that. But the state industries predominate, and they are becoming stronger and stronger. And the largest banks are all state-owned. Now, just across the river, I'm going to wind up on this, from Hong Kong, sits the city of Shenzhen. It was one of the special economic zones established to lure Western technology. And these zones originally, with thousands of labor-intensive factories, millions of workers earned low wages, and they were centers of capitalist exploitation and enormous profits for US and other global capitalists. Shenzhen grew from a fishing village, then to a small city of 30,000 in 1979, to a megacity of 20 million, with the largest migrant population also in China. It has a population three times the size of Hong Kong, just next door. It's just on the other side of the river. With investments via Hong Kong, this new city became a massive, polluted factory town, with sweatshops spewing out dark clouds of toxic smoke. That's a fact. The central government and the Chinese Communist Party made a decision to reverse course in Shenzhen and in all the cities of China. This was a big discussion to give priority not only to raising the standard of living and education and consumer goods, but also to really change the environment and the climate and the living conditions and to use central planning to quickly reach these goals. And their goals are way beyond the uh, Green New Deal, the Democratic Party here. We should just, you know, they are way beyond. Today, Shenzhen has the largest fleet of electric buses in the world, about 16,000, has all electric cabs, and, and that's just in the last five years since this policy began. In the past five years, through city and national urban planning, Shenzhen is today one of the most livable cities in China, with extensive parks, has tree-lined streets. It aims to have fully 80% of its new buildings green certified by next year, 2020. It's full of apartment blocks and office towers and modern factories with advanced equipment, manufacturing and robotics and automation and giant tech startups. Now, the Chinese government announced this week that they intend to build this southern city of Shenzhen into a pilot demonstration of socialism with Chinese characteristics. That they're going to go much further. And they said Hong Kong is not suitable to hold up the major role of the greater, what they call, Bay Area strategy. And the home court will be China's mainland cities. Now, the Greater Bay Area is now a population center of some 80 million people. So you could see that Hong Kong is now a small piece of this. They were once 27% of the GDP of China, and today it's 3% and going down fast. So if that, if the banking changes, and that money starts even more flowing into Shenzhen, well, that, that is saying something to Hong Kong. Shenzhen will become one of the leading cities of the world in terms of economic strength. This is their goal, quality of development, its research and development input, industrial innovation capacity, quality of public services, ecological environment. They plan for it to be first rate with advanced communication and medical instruments being a specialty. The city plans to establish yeah, the city plans to establish a maritime university, a national deep sea research center, and explore the establishment of a maritime development bank. 
Uh, they, they are really developing uh, urban agriculture in new and kind of incredible ways that um, are, are hard to even, for us to even grasp here, but it does show what planning is capable of. So I just want to conclude by saying that they're choices. And do we stand with development, with dramatic reductions in poverty, with increasing the levels of skill and literacy, or with the cages and homelessness in Hong Kong, financed and funded movements that are organized by the National Endowment for Democracy. These are the choices, and they're not explained here, and they need to be much more, because it's part of the movement here. This propaganda is aimed directly at the movement in the US in an effort to flip it, to turn it, to be suspicious of socialist development, of planning, to feel demoralized and cynical, angry and alienated. And if we're going to combat it, we need to combat it with ideas and also with planning and with building a deep support for the ability of socialism to meet the challenge of a new age. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for an excellent presentation. Uh, before we have um, discussion, I just have a few announcements. Um, first of all, on Saturday, there are two events that we wanted to bring to people's attention. Uh, there's a day of remembrance for Nicholas Hayward, Jr. and Sr. Uh, Nicholas Hayward, Jr. was, was uh, killed by the police a few decades ago. And it was a movement, you know, to bring justice. And his father died just recently. Uh, anyway, there's going to be a day, this day of remembrance on Saturday from noon to 8 p.m. It's being held in Brooklyn at the Nicholas Hayward Jr. Park. That's Wickoff between Bond and Hoyt. Um, and then later on that evening, there's going to be a tribute to our freedom fighters. This is an annual event that the Malcolm X Commemoration Committee holds um, in honor of political prisoners, which we know are still languishing in prisons today, like Mamiya, like Leonard Peltier, and many others. Um, anyway, that's going to be from Saturday. That's going to be on Saturday from 3 until 7 p.m. at the Langston Hughes Community Library that's located at 100. Uh, dash zero one Northern Boulevard, Queens. Okay, and then uh, a couple more announcements. There's no Workers World Party meeting next Thursday, August 29th. The next Workers World Party meeting will be a special forum, which is going to be featuring Alessio Arena from the Fronte Popolare in Italy. He's going to be here for a visit, and he's going to be giving a presentation on the EU and the role of Germany. So we want to really invite people to come and hear this, this very, it's going to be a very fascinating report. Um, and also before, again, before we open up the floor for discussion, uh, we want to do something on fundraising, um, take up a collection, because we don't depend on any corporations or rich benefactors to help keep the Solidarity Center open, which is really a movement center for so many uh, off, office, office, uh, it offers office space to so many important organizations and struggles in the city that represent really international struggles. Uh, so Workers World Party is just one group that uses this space, but there are other groups like FIRE and the IAC and the Ecuadorans and et cetera, uh, the Haitians, they all use our office when they need to. So in order to keep the lights on, the electricity going, and the copier going, we really want to um, ask for your support. Whatever you can give, large or small, will be very much appreciated, because we'll go to, you know, to making sure that this office keeps running, because we want to make sure that the struggle keeps running. So, um, so as the bucket is, is go, uh, the buckets are going on, going around, I think. Yeah. Um, think about your questions. We're going to have a pro, um, progressive stack, which means that 
when you raise your hand, I'll take your name down, but we want to give priority to, of course, people of color and women and LGBTQ people and people with disabilities, etc. So anyway, let's open up the floor for any questions or comments that you may have on Sarah's report. Um, I was just wondering, because, you know, everyone has, like, you know, we, we, we have so few sources that, uh, news sources that aren't, uh, you know, biased or propaganda. What are some journalists who are on the ground in Hong Kong or who have studied this for a long time who we can reach out to or uh, keep track of to sort of get, you know, un, uh, decentralized news? I should mention that people can mention, uh, if you can say what your pronoun is. Oh, uh, she, her. Okay. So what's going to happen is that Sarah's going to take some questions, because at the end, we, the, the speakers always get an opportunity to make closing remarks and answer questions. Okay. Thank you, Daisy. Okay, Comrade Shahid is next. Hi, Sarah. Uh, my name is Shahid Kamrid, and I'm a Secretary General of Pakistan USA Freedom Forum. It's a wonderful report, and thank you, Chase, for just tomorrow's protest against the Greyhound buses and the illegal search by the federal government, ICE, Immigration Custom Enforcement. Thank you very much. Uh, Sarah, thanks a lot for your written piece on Workers World, latest paper about the Kashmiri, what happening over here. This thing shows the Western brain, educated brain, who has the greedy basis, who based on the greed, that they cry for the Hong Kong, but they never mention a single word for the Kashmiri who is under curfew, no link to outside, pregnant mothers cannot call the ambulance when the time comes. So this is shows with, and the Kashmir is a valley about the 800,000 people. And think about it, there's a 900,000 army apparatus is there. And that's the double standard of these people who claim that they have the human rights, care about the human rights. One thing I would be very much clear, anybody who's listening and not watching, the guys, we stand for the freedom of speech. Not, never think about us that we are against the freedom of speech. But one thing we have to be clear, we will not be a fooled by the capitalist brain, educated brain with the degrees of our thing. And that's why Pakistan USA Freedom Forum believe the Western education system is failed. They produced only slave brain to the capital society, not for the humanity and not for the principles. So this is my input in this. And I'm asked that 24th of Saturday, we have a demo in front of the United Nations, the Free Kashmir, which under the rule of the Pakistani people, our government, they're coming over there at 12 o'clock. So if you join on 24th, so it will be good. And let's stand for the solidarity with the Kashmiri people. And Kashmir will be free. And as per the United Nations resolutions in 1947 to up till now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Comrade Shaheed. Um, Taryn? So I, I just wanted to thank uh, the party and uh, Sarah for presenting this really important perspective on what's going on in Hong Kong. I think that uh, sometimes people take it for granted that this is sometimes the only political organization in the United States that will actually have the courage to go against this sort of insidious U.S. war propaganda, which is as, you know, it, it's so ubiquitous you don't even see it anymore. You know, it's just something that you that you feel that when you read about something in the news, you you have like a small inkling of, well, are, am I sure I want to say it? But no, I mean, like it's really that deep. It's that deep. It was your education. It was every piece of media that you imbibe. It's you know, what your parents teach you, it's what your family teaches you, it's everything. Um, so I just want to thank uh, Workers World Party again for having the courage and the principles to uh, stand against U.S. imperialism in a, not in a moralistic way, but as seeing the defeat of U.S. imperialism as being part and parcel of our own liberation, of our entire global working class liberation. 
Um, and then I just also wanted to make a plug that if you can't put any money into the bucket because you don't have any cash on you, like me today, you can also use Venmo. Uh, you can just go ahead and, and Venmo at Workers World and you can Venmo a dollar, two dollars, five dollars, however much you need or however much you can spare. Uh, so if you couldn't put money into the bucket tonight for dinner, you can Venmo. If you couldn't you know, put cash in the bucket because you don't have any cash, you can also hit Venmo. So I'm just plugging that. That's all. Thanks. And also you can give the Patreon. Yeah, you can also sign up for the Patreon. Um, no, but it's just, the Venmo is like one, you can do it. Lots of people use Venmo, just hit go, you know, it's good. And it keeps our air conditioning working. <laughs> Okay, I, I would now like to introduce uh, Comrade Larry Holmes, who is first secretary of the Workers' World. He's going to come to the front, make a comment. Hi, comrades. Is this one? It's not on yet. There's a button on it. I'm sorry. It's a button on it? I'm a little out of position here. There's an on-off switch on it. There you go. Well, hi. It's hot. Now, uh, thank Comrade Sarah for the excellent and uh, well-researched uh, report and the video uh, uh, accompaniment. Um, if, it, if it seems like the big mouthpieces for U.S. imperialism have been a little muted, like Trump, for example, uh, and that could change, especially if the situation intensifies. Uh, I actually think Comrade Sarah kind of laid the, the basis for that strategy. Uh, there's a lot at stake here for U.S. imperialism. They would rather have the CIA and the National Endowment and all of their, their, their infrastructure, politically, economically, they'd rather have that doing the job as opposed to, at least at this point, taking the lead position. What are the reasons for this? Is China's huge. And how they deal with China, they want to get rid of it, but it's kind of big <laughs> for them to do that. What some of them are thinking about in terms of the situation in Hong Kong, they want it to spread to the mainland. And some of them are hopeful that it may turn into a counter-revolution. They can't say it, but that's plan B, you know. But there's a flip side to that, which is another reason why they're a little muted. If things go wrong and the reaction of the Chinese Communist Party and the masses there is like, you're going to play that game? Guess what? We try, we, we've been trying to use soft power. We've been trying to be diplomatic. We've been trying to make agreements. I'll tell you what, that's off. You want counter-revolution? How about revolution first? A and it could actually push China and the Chinese Communist Party in a more left direction, in a more militant direction. And that's a problem for U.S. imperialism. Why? Because China's big. <laughs> China's very big. It, 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 it is a challenge. And, and, and I, I think the way that Sarah described, you know, it's, it's a class position. What side are you on? You know, uh, we have to be prepared to answer complicated questions. It's, it's a big confusion for the left. Uh, our position is fairly unique. There are some in, in our camp, you understand it more clearly, who see through all the grass and all the, you know. Uh, there are others who, you know, they kind of have like a little bit of a, they're in the middle, you know. Uh, the, the protests are good, but they can't be so reactionary, kind of like that, you know, they're trying to have it. And, and we'll, we'll have to become, you know, more conversant, more able to... Uh, to deal with the complexities, the nuances. And then there are some who are, you know, supposedly on the left, who have basically given up on China and consider it to be reactionary and imperialist. And to them, any rebellion against uh, China and the Communist Party there is, a, it, 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 by their definition, it's progressive, you know, which is, that's, um, you know, 
<laughs> that's terribly, terribly wrong and could misinform and mislead a lot of people. But uh, as much as we have the burden as uh, defenders of the Chinese Revolution and all of its contradictions uh, and, you know, opponents sworn to the death opponents of U.S. imperialism and all imperialism, it's a big challenge for the Communist Party in China. And, 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 you know, they're number one. They're on the line here, what they do. Forty years ago, I think it was about then, under the Dang leadership, they decided to turn inward uh, to revert from being a, a country that was promoting worldwide revolution, you know. Just, well, we've got to develop our own productive forces, you know. Whether we even have a cohesive and united view on that in the party is another question. You know, I think Sarah has, you know, shed a lot of light on that uh, and also, you know, uh, given us the view of some other, you know, let us know about the view of some others. For example, the, uh, the, the party in Britain, you know, that some of you are familiar with. We did a, made a pamphlet on it and it was very informative, you know. My, my view, short of a continuing discussion in the party, which we must have, is that China had every right to develop its productive forces. They had every right to do that, you know. Was there a downside? It made it easier for some to give up on China, who say they're revolutionary, because China had held that position for a long time. You know, actually, in comparison or in competition, or as against the former Soviet Union. You know, it, it went off the rails with Soviet social imperialism, but that's, that's another story. When, when you let capitalism in, even if you want to try to control it and use it and then maybe get rid of it, which is, you know, I, that, that's the thinking, you know, of, of, of the leaders in the party. You open the door, you get a lot of the garbage, ideologically and politically, and you strengthen a, 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 a social class, you know, because you have millionaires and billionaires there. And then you bring in all the shit from the West, all the counter-revolutionary shit. So you can't be surprised if here or there, all of a sudden, it bubbles up. Because that comes with what you did, you know? Uh, I mean, even the contradiction of one country, two systems. How long can that last? <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's a nice idea. And, 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 and from a, and, and from a, a, a nationalist perspective, which they have every right to have, by the way, in my view, especially after an endless period of being victimized by colonialism and imperialism, first the Japanese and then the West, you know. <laughs> the Chinese people, whatever their situation is, they have a right to say, listen, we, you know, we're important, and, and we're not going to take anybody's crap, anybody's, you know, subjugation any, anymore. But... These contradictions bring with them problems. So is that, keep things in perspective. Hong Kong, what makes Hong Kong really important is it's, a, it's another global financial center. That's another reason why some of the big imperialist voices are a little bit, because you know they got, on one hand they want counter-revolution, they want to spread to the mainland. On the other hand they're worried about falling into a endless hole of capitalists imploding, the capitalist economy imploding. So if one of their centers in Hong Kong, if that's affected by anything, then bad timing for them. <laughs> and, they're, and, they're, and they're worried about that. But remember, Hong Kong is important, but it's about seven or eight million people. How many people are there in China? 1.7, 1.8 billion, you know, something like that. You know, so keep it, keep it in perspective. Anyway, I, I, I hope that, you know, beyond this discussion, we continue this because understanding the contradictions so that we're in a better position to defend China is going to be paramount. Without just, without saying that we give a blank check to the Chinese Communist Party, you know, uh, we can't do that. I don't, nobody thinks that's a good idea. It won't be helpful to defending them. Actually, by 
delving in and, and, and becoming conversant and comfortable with the contradictions. It'll be the best way that we can prepare the best elements in the revolutionary movement to defend China. And it's going to need defense because you see what's happening with U.S. imperialism and China. Thank you, Danny. Comrades, I was just thinking about the, comp the fact that the timing of Trump's imposition of tariffs on Chinese goods and the uh, demonstrations in Hong Kong are happening at the same time with the same, you know, point. So I thought that was interesting. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Okay, Fred? So I didn't follow from the beginning um, of, of this uh, Hong Kong thing. Uh, I, I saw it on, uh, on the internet. Um, it was uncommented by RT. It's like a con continuous video of what's going on. Uh, the, the Western medias are speaking about the reason being uh, an extradition law, which you didn't mention that, and I think that's very confusing. Um, it seems uh, justify that people who live in one area should not be extradited to another area. And also um, some sort of fear and, and, and saying that there's a recognition that the people of Hong Kong have their specificity and therefore uh, that uh, maybe China would be uh, willing, we're trying to, um, to, uh, to cancel the, the special status of Hong Kong. So could you please address that? And, you know, and see, if we have to defend China, we, we need to know those those issues. Yes, thank you, Fred. Okay, Tony, then Sue Davis, and then Nate. So I just want to say uh, a couple of short things. One is just to see that some of the people we know and the progressive movement that we've been in, this, in the streets with are all rah-rah. Uh, to what's happening in Hong Kong, and in and, and talking about, you know, they're fighting the cops, and not really getting, not getting about the American flag, not getting who's really involved in it. It's just, they see that, they see a bunch of people in the streets fighting, and so they're just for it. And it's literally people we know. Um, so, I also just wanted to mention about tomorrow. First of all, I want to say that we, we've done a considerable amount of outreach to build this demonstration. But we had a tremendous um, press conference on Monday morning. Yes, on the front page. Yeah, and um, it was it was interesting because actually Tony did most of the work um, on Sunday. We had decided uh, maybe that we were going to do this, but we were going to do it at 11 a.m. But then the Laundry Workers Center said they wanted to do outreach at 8 a.m. So. We said, well, we want to do it because that's when they want to do it. And so um, Tony put out a press release like at 6 o'clock. And, uh, you know, Teresa had said, you know, we, we think uh, the Spanish media is going to be interested in this because of what's happened in El Paso. And she was completely right. We got there and really so, me so much of the media was there. Um, and even like uh, El Diario had told him, well, that's too early. I can't get there at 8 o'clock in the morning. But he said, if you send me pictures and, you know, I'll do these interviews. And El Diario had something. New York, New York One Noticias had something. Uh, Channel 11 had something. Um, Terry told me, um, I can't remember who she, who she saw it, but uh, Channel 7 was there. Uh, the Daily News. I mean, I don't know if everybody covered it because that was also the day that uh, Pantaleo was fired. And that sort of, I think, took over what the media was focusing on. But it was, it was good. And so I, I anticipate that much of those media forces will probably come to the demonstration tomorrow. So I just also want to say that um, in doing this, uh, part of how we did it was that we went downstairs to the lines where people were lining up to get on the bus. And, you know, you sort of got into conversations with people because that, of course, works a lot better to tell people what we were doing. And we got a lot of support, really a lot of support. And many people 
um, thanked us for doing what we were doing. Um, and there were many migrants who were waiting to get on those Greyhound buses. So even if those people don't come to the demonstration, this is building a movement. What we do when we do the outreach is not just about getting people to the demo. It's about being out there and showing that this is a war on migrants and that we're going to be there and we're going to continue this fight. Thank you, Tony. Hey, Sue, and then um, Nate, and we'll take another a last, a last show of hands after Nate. Uh, I have a comment. Actually, what Mary said is what I was going to bring up because it doesn't seem like with all this saber rattling that that Trump has been doing about tariffs. It's no coincidence that this whole struggle has, has broken out. So Mary said it, but I'm seconding it. Anyway, Nate, would you tell us where are we going to meet um, tomorrow? Is it going to be on 8th Avenue? Is it going to be on 42nd? We'll meet at 42nd and 8th Avenue. So both answers are correct. Time. Time. <laughs> Six o'clock. Forty second and Eighth Avenue. Six o'clock. The southwest corner is really, really specific. Um, yeah, exactly. Right there on the Port Authority. Exactly. Um, I think was it was I next on stack? Yeah. Um, were you finished, Sue? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, I just actually just wanted to say something real quick also about the extradition treaty, which I think is really important to kind of cut through the propaganda about that. I mean, one thing is that Hong Kong is the only city in the world that has extradition treaties that are different than the country it's a part of. I mean, could you imagine if, like, Houston had different, uh, like, independent uh, international policies with, say, Mexico and Honduras than the rest of the United States? That would, we would consider that bizarre. But that's the situation with Hong Kong right now, and that's what this extradition treaty is about. I mean, in big part, is I mean, that's, that's bizarre that Hong Kong has its own international um, relations. One thing I haven't seen mentioned anywhere in the bourgeois media is who exactly in Hong Kong is so afraid of being extradited? Um, China, you know, people like to talk about, oh, there's all these billionaires in China. One thing they, have, they don't talk about is how many... Chinese billionaires have been executed, have been convicted of crimes and executed. How many billionaires in the history of the United States have been executed? Zero. I think the closest lately is, Jeff, is Epstein, and he was, and, you know, um, and we all know why that happened. Exactly. So, you know, I think that, that right there shows so much about the nature of China among all its contradictions, that they're actually executing billionaires for for corruption and I mean and it's not just something to the state I mean you can go on law firms that represent American firms in China and they talk about the, like what to do to make sure you don't get killed by the Chinese workers rising up and demanding better pay because they that happens in China and and that says a lot about the class character of Chinese society that that those who, who here are completely impervious to everything are there vulnerable and it's really the bourgeoisie in Hong Kong it's these billionaires in Hong Kong they're the ones who are afraid of getting extradited and are so adamant that we have to have some kind of that, that, that this has to be prevented because they 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 are you know they know that at, at the end of the 50-year period in 2047 when the two countries, uh, the two systems, one country comes to an end, that they are going to see the wrath of the working and oppressed masses of China who will, be, who will come to power in Hong Kong. And so I think it's important to see that this extradition treaty, on the one hand, it's ultimately a distraction, but insofar as it is a, uh, a center of the protests, it's about... Uh, it's about preventing billion, protecting billionaires, ultimately. Just one last thing about who's protected and not protected. Uh, Sarah mentioned this thing about the Federation of Trade Unions and the Confederation of Trade Unions. So the Federation of Unions is the pro-China one who led the, the communist uprising in 1967. Their offices have been defaced by the protesters 
and attacked, and they've been late and they graffitied that they're rioters and terrorists for having led the 67 protests. So they're very, very clear, an uprising against British colonialism to improve the living standards of working people in Hong Kong is the enemy of these protests. And that's been explicitly stated, you know, with the destruction of, of these, these uh, trade union headquarters. So I think that says a lot about, um, again, the, the class character and, you know, um, the vocabulary of protest belongs to the left and the right. And there's a lot of um, parallels to the Tea Party we can draw here. Um, you, know, you know, there were a lot of angry people in the Tea Party. It doesn't mean it's not a progressive movement. Um, and uh, just lastly, I wanted, to, I wanted to ask, what do you think the U.S., both for the, from the U.S. side and the Chinese side, what do you think the long, the long game is in terms of Hong Kong? What are the long-term plans that the U.S. has for Hong Kong? And what are the, the long-term way, in the, not, not next week, not next month, but you know, in the long term, that China is, is relating to Hong Kong and, and you know, the forces associated with it? Thanks, everybody. Okay, so I want to take a final show of hands. I see Kathy. Anybody else? Last chance. And then Sarah's going to do closing remarks, answer questions. Is, is that it, Kathy? Oh. Okay. Go ahead, Kathy. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for the talk and for the article in the paper. Uh, I do want to say, and thank you, Larry, for the remarks about how, how complex uh, the whole situation in China is. But I do want to say the movement is very confused about this. Tony's right and everybody's right. And if you read the movement, progressive, you know, Facebook pages and newspapers and e-zines, you'll see mostly the support for what's the people in the streets in Hong Kong. But one thing is very important. You really have to understand U.S. imperialism. If you don't understand what U.S. imperialism is and its goals in the world, you're kind of lost. You really have to get that. You really have to know that. You have to look at the world based on an understanding of imperialism. Because we live in a world that is encircled by imperialists and we live in the heartland of it. We, and we've always got to look and see what the goals are and what the sneaky ways that imperialism has to get into countries, influence their economies, try to undo any progressive or revolutionary governments like in Venezuela, for instance. Um, and I do want to say, I think that's a reason why everybody should try to get out this issue of the paper tomorrow over the weekend and just really get it out and, and also get out what uh, the article up at workers.org, uh, what's on Facebook and so on. Try to get these things out in social media to get out our position. I do want to say this is not the first time, nor will it be the last, that Workers' World Party has a unique position in the struggle. And I remember back to the 60s when the Arab-Palestinian Muslim communities supported the Palestinian struggle, but nobody in the progressive movement and the left and the communist and socialist parties did except for Workers' World Party. And we held a demonstration, was it 1967, I think, yes. mm -hmm. against Israel's attacks and murders of the Palestinians with the backing of the U.S. And we were proud to do that. We, we were. And we have, you know, we were, we still, we, we still, you know, we support the Palestinian struggle to the hilt. And now we see many people in the movement, especially youth and including Jewish youth, are starting are supporting the Palestinian people against Israel and pointing out the role of the US and giving Israel billions of dollars. And I'll say the role of Ilhan Omar and Rashida Talib are helping push, I would say, many of many more people to the left because they're seeing the truth about what the US is doing. Um, and you know, to aid Israel. So uh, you know, I think we have we have a lot to be proud of in our own history, and I do want to end by saying, and I I do think we have to study more about China. I think it's really important. Larry was raising this. I remember marching with Maoists in the seven, you know, in the seventies. A lot of us did, and we supported the Chinese Revolution, and we'd be marching 
uh, at a demonstration and all of a sudden we'd be arguing with the person next to us against the concept of Soviet social imperialism and we'd be, we'd be in the middle of the march and we'd be arguing people, you know, holding the same banner we were holding. I mean, it was, it was kind of crazy, but that's what happened. And then a lot of those groups vanished. A lot of them just disappeared. They either gave up on China completely and vanished. And I knew a family friend, she just vanished. She had been a real supporter of China and now gone. Or they became totally supportive of every single thing China did, including some of the things we would think were not exactly the best in the best interests of the masses. But also to mention, I'm glad Sarah brought up the poverty of people in Hong Kong. And you think about, if you, if it, if you think about the conditions when the Chinese Revolution happened, Sarah mentioned that people were barefoot, starving, had no homes. It was a peasant country, mostly non-industrialized. There was wide-scale poverty, terrible poverty. And now, at least 800 million people in 70 years have been brought out of that kind of poverty. And people, you know, have health care, they have education, they have housing. You know, and compared to a lot of the really poor, oppressed countries around the world, where people are living under $2 a day, where they don't have basic necessities, even sanitation. I mean, you know, think about that. So you have to balance it out when you're thinking about what's going on in China with the masses. And I want to say, I think a lot of youth in China don't like what's going on in Hong Kong. There are a lot of revolutionary youth in China. There are a lot of youth in China who still support Mao, who support Marx, uh, you know, and we have to think about them too. They take out, they're like, whatever, 1.4 billion part people on the planet, many of them young, and they're revolutionaries. So, to say that, and I do want to mention, I you came here, you said, okay. I'm finished. I have a card for Sharon E, who was in the hospital, got out tonight. People, if you haven't signed it, please see me. Okay, thanks, Kathy. I yeah, before I turn it over to Sarah, you know, just another very important point about China, especially, you know, during the Mao years, is that they were a beacon of hope for so many, um, you know, national liberation movements and struggles, including right here in the United States. Um, they, you know, when the Black Liberation Movement was under attack here, um, and uh, especially the Panthers, and you know the the deacons for self defense, and you know it, it was China <laughs> who gave sanctuary to Robert Williams, you know to to Huey P Newton, to the other Panthers who were under such the you know had to escape repression, you know because of COINTELPRO here. So anyway, this is before you know the capitalist inroads into to China in the early 70s or mid 70s, I should say. But anyway, just, so it's, it's, it's very important for us to study this, this history, you know, to counter, you know, all of the horrific, you know, propaganda, against, especially against Mao and against the Chinese Revolution, mm -hmm. you know. And it was our party that stated that this, even though this was a peasant revolution, peasant-led revolution, we saw it as a workers' revolution. This was a this was part of the working workers' revolution, um, just as much as what happened in the Soviet Union. So, anyway, I, you know it's good for us to study this history because, again, in this country, how many people know anything about the Chinese Revolution except for the, you know, just the the um, the brainwashing, right? The brainwashing against the Chinese Revolution because it did uplift, you know, a quarter of the world's humanity, <laughs> you know, in so many ways and continues to do so as, as Sarah's slideshow shows. So we have a lot of, hopefully, education work to do, as, along, with, along with building uh, defense of the Chinese Revolution, you know, in the streets, you know, if we have to. So anyway, just wanted to raise that point. So I'm going to turn it over to Sarah now. Hope I can uh, deal with all these uh, really, really good questions. 
uh, let me first say in terms of current news, uh, was it a, a good question? Uh, on the role of the NED, National Endowment for Democracy, uh, the gray zone has, has printed a lot. Uh, Max Blumenthal, Dan Cohen, uh, we've, we've linked to that. Um, Freedom Road Socialist Organization printed a large, long article uh, giving an evaluation of China defense and support, critical, uh, explaining the movement in Hong Kong. Uh, Popular Resistance, which is a website um, by the Venezuela Embassy uh, Protectors, has written and posted some very good articles. Um, and, and they also posted my article and have posted other folks' articles. Uh, but I really will say that Workers World over decades has, um, there have been many zigs and zags, uh, always consistently defended China and the revolution as being a fundamental break. And at the same time, it, it did not mean we supported every policy change. We were strong supporters of revolutionary developments in China when it really, there was an attempt to engage the whole population uh, and to especially raise up the poorest, to be directly struggling, to even in industrial development with the great leap forward and the build the people's communes. It's just that China didn't have the capacity to, to make some of these things succeed because they were blockaded and sanctioned and isolated. Uh, but they were a beacon of hope because it was such a huge thing that they were attempting to do. Uh, and to, to again and again struggle to, for equality in a, in a country where the landlords and had so ruled that it was so part of the culture to, to look down on the peasants and, and something that's very, um, as, as deep as racism is absolutely part of the culture here in every way, that, that um, disregard for the, the peasants in, in China and throughout Asia ran deep. So to lift up, that was a big part of the Cultural Revolution. Uh, and, and we also explained and defended China is still a socialist country, but in 1979 there was a sharp turn with uh, Deng Xiaoping coming to Washington and uh, really developing uh, what was an effort at, at enticing the capitalists of big corporations into China uh, and developing the economy in China by investment, huge investments. The, the very same month as that visit to Washington, uh, China attacked Vietnam. And the level, the struggle with the Soviet Union reached a whole new level. Now, we said, no, we don't support that. We support revolutionary Vietnam, who had handed US imperialism the biggest defeat in its history. Uh, so we were completely with Vietnam. Um, but at the same time, we said it doesn't mean that China is a capitalist country. They are making a compromise and a deal with the devil. And we hope they'll be able to survive this. Now, all that's 40 years ago. So there have been these struggles in China, even among the leadership. But the one thing that was important was they maintained the Communist Party in leadership. And there have been endless efforts to sabotage that. Tiananmen Square was one thing, because it was happening at the same time as they were able, through Gorbachev and then Yeltsin, to absolutely flip the Soviet Union and, and pull it apart, dismember it. That's what they wanted to do to China 30 years ago. And they were pushed back. And at that time, there was some reevaluation within China, beginning to be. So. I wanted to, from there, very much pick up on, on, on Larry's point. Will this be another step that moves China to the left? Because it's not just economic, the struggle for economic development. It, it has to be a political struggle. 
This is something that Fidel, I think, in Cuba has raised again and again. And of course, they're right on the tip, so small. But that if the masses aren't one to politically defending the state, then they're easy prey. For, because U.S. propaganda is strong and skilled. They have just hundreds of years of how to permeate the culture. And they have fertile ground because there's inequality and there's anger over it still. So we, we can't forget that. Um, I did want to very much, uh, it, it's important to raise Kashmir because that's going on as this is happening. And here is complete martial law, total lockdown. Now, the people of Kashmir are an oppressed nation with the right to self-determination. That's never been recognized. Uh, it's still being debated 60, 70 years on in the United Nations. So they'll pass a resolution, but just like with Palestine, they never do anything. And the people exist in a completely um, captured position that's just gotten much harder, because they had a special status, and that just got revoked um, overnight. And it was a decision by the Modi government uh, at the very time when there was a whole campaign against the Muslim population of India. So it shows there's an effort to use reaction and an effort to further divide as a way, that's the right-wing way, to stay in power. you got to whip up part of the population against another part. And it is true that the whole socialist path of development is how to build the greatest unity and especially always to give the greatest recognition to those who are the most oppressed, who had the least rights. It's the only way you're going to turn it around. Uh, but the, the capitalist way, it's just like what Trump is doing today. That's what they decided to do in India. Oh, okay, we're going to rally the, the uh, most right-wing forces. So um, anyway, we, very much we stand with Kashmir. And, 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 and we stand also with, with Gaza. Now, I mean, week after week after week, the youth go out and they are shot down. These Friday demonstrations, and yet they come back again and again. And you, you can't find an article online about it. Maybe an electronic intifada, but you won't see it in the media here. You won't see it in the corporate media. Not at all. Or Yemen where, you know, four years on this struggle and the U.S. is firing a, a drones and bombs and missiles and a naval blockade every day. Just, just yesterday, uh, a U.S. drone over Yemen was shot down. And the U.S. objected. How, how dare you shoot down our drone that's bombing you? Um, so, at any rate, we want to remember those struggles and, and raise them up so that people who are confused by this see the difference, why the support, for Hong Kong. Uh, I, I so very much agree with Larry's point that China is big. And what's different is it is now really rapidly developing and modernizing. And so that changes it. The, the one country, two systems is an inherently unstable, impossible arrangement. It was going to be in place for 50 years. But that's making a lot of assumptions that the imperialists abide by any treaty. It's like assuming you could sign an agreement with a boss to have labor peace for the next 50 years. It, it, it won't last six months. I mean, it's not the way that they function. And so uh, they're just doing what they can possibly do to break the agreement or challenge it. Now. This was an important question on the extradition law, and and we're speaking too long. Hopefully, I'm not speaking too long now, but um, so I, I didn't go into that. But uh, this is really uh, in foreign affairs, even according to the one country, two systems. Uh, China was to have control of foreign affairs, and the question of extradition was was actually left until later, but it was seemed to be understood that. This is part of foreign affairs, China has. Um, <clears throat> because it wasn't actually codified in any way, uh, Hong Kong has become a magnet, not only for corrupt billionaires that are 
fleeing prosecution from China, but all over Asia. And, and the, the case began with um, a wealthy Taiwanese businessman who murdered his pregnant girlfriend and doesn't deny it. I mean, he doesn't say, like, I want a fair trial. Yeah, I did it. But he's in Hong Kong, and he can't be extradited. And Taiwan, who's no friend of China, demanded he be extradited because this created such a, a stir and an outrage. So it's, it's an open city where embezzlers and anyone sort of running away from prosecution uh, from throughout Asia go. And as a matter of fact, it's so understood that all sorts of billionaires from China and many other places uh, want to invest in apartments. That's why the real estate goes up and up and up and have bank accounts in Hong Kong in case they got to, you know, skip fast. That, that's the understanding. Um, so uh, to say something else on, on Hong Kong, the way it's structured, half the seats in the Hong Kong legislature, what's, what's called the Lego, um, are guaranteed to capitalists and landlords. Half wow. the seats. So that means they can veto anything or just keep it gummed up forever. And then the other half seats are held, um, a majority of the other popularly elected seats are actually held by groups who are pro-China. Uh, but the power of the capitalist bloc, along with these any defunded groups, are able to stop anything from happening, including even a tax increase to build some popular housing, to do anything at all. Those low taxes come from, you know, the real estate interests. I think 90% of Hong Kong, Kuala Lumpur, the new territories, is uh, open land. So why don't they build housing there? Because capitalists, the more the real estate value goes up, if you don't open all that other land for housing, they make money. And that's what they're in business to do. So for them, it's entirely reasonable to just have real estate going higher and higher and people living in rooms. The average room in Hong Kong is about smaller than a parking spot uh, in, in the U.S. is today in a parking garage. So, you know, this is um, the things that aren't raised here, but, but everyone in Hong Kong is dealing with it and knowing they have no future because of it. And when they're told that it's because the present Hong Kong government is to blame, that's where the anger turns. How could it not? How could it not? So uh, it has made uh, China extremely vulnerable. Uh, I'll just end on, on, on that. What's the long-term prognosis of this? And I, I never uh, felt I could read tea leaves or, 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 or know the future in that way, because there are always the surprise things that happen that you didn't take into account, and we only know a little bit. But certainly, always um, the U.S. and British and the imperialist forces have wanted to use Hong Kong as a wedge into China. They thought they were training a whole generation who would be able, as socialism collapsed in China, would go in and be, you know, their collaborators. I mean, that was their picture of they, they're very well educated, but they're completely uh, business and bank insurance companies, it's where the big accounting firms are and all of that, uh, and they know China very well, and they're Chinese. So they were to be this new army, uh, such as the U.S. and the British and other imperialists have had time and again. You, you need a whole class, a whole class of collaborators. Uh, but it didn't turn out that way, see, and so they're very frustrated. Will they keep trying? Uh, of course, of course. And will they try other things? Of course. And can they get it going at the same time? Because they want to infect the, the um, capitalist groupings in China, within China, and they also want to impact here. So it's not surprising that really wonderful people who were in the streets fighting here, the cops, see an image of a struggle using flames I mean, picture would any U.S. city, could we go and attack and take apart a police station, 
break into the legislature, tear it apart, uh, and and no one is shot. I mean, there's not a day in the U.S. Occupy the airports. Occupy the airports. There's not a day in the U.S. where someone isn't killed by the cops. Killed by the cops. And yet, not one person has died in these exchanges. It's, it's almost shocking. Um, and, and as China has said, look, look what happened in New York and in London and cities around the world to the Occupy movement. We haven't done that. So, but it, it can't just be answered like that. I, I mean, I see some of the pro-China demonstrations are saying, oh, well, we support the police. I don't, I don't know, that's not a very convincing argument. <coughs> but, um, now, China wants to maintain the one country, two systems. They do, they have a stake in it. And we can say it's an unequal treaty, they're forced into it. There was no other way for them to reclaim control of Hong Kong. Uh, but it is for them the way in which they're speaking to a population of Taiwan and also to their own capitalist class, saying we're guaranteeing you certain rights if you'll be loyal to one country. Uh, I, I think it won't last 50 years, that's for sure. Uh, and. China has two ways in which they're responding. They released a whole series of videos showing what military intervention could do in Hong Kong, or if there's war. They're pretty vivid videos. And they're saying we have the right to self-defense. However, they've also released this study saying Shenzhen is actually a far more modern, developed, planned economy, and it's just across the river. Uh, and we're able to move financial arrangements. Their banks are actually larger than U.S. banks. So they could also do something which the capitalists truly fear, and that is being made irrelevant. That's a big threat. So anyway, there's a, a lot in the balance here. I think the important thing for us uh, is always our support and our defense of the Chinese Revolution of the attempt to build socialism as difficult as it is, uh, and to also see in China today, because the working class is educated and skilled, uh, and there's, there's a whole new opening happening. It, it has changed history in the past, the Chinese Revolution, and that in the future, I think, will really continue to be very much true. This is a dying system right here. It offers nothing except militarism and war and racism and division of every form. So uh, our, our hearts are with those who are fighting always for a new world and for unity uh, in, in every way. paper out with Sarah's article on Hong Kong and again uh, we'll see everyone tomorrow at 6 p.m. at Port Authority 42nd and 8th Avenue get ice off the Greyhound buses and also again there's no meeting next Thursday so be looking out on your email for this special form on September 5th thanks to everyone for coming out and please put away your chairs and throw away your trash and sign the card for Sharon E if you haven't already. See Kathy?